sure I've got enough okay. room for her shoulders. Um, anytime I'm doing a portrait too, it's really important to get in the neck and the shoulders too, so it doesn't just look like a floating head. helpful to do like a, some people like to do a big circle I don't do that usually because it seems like I'm just making a generic shape and then I don't rely on the, the shapes of the bone structure but I mean if you know as long as you can kind of switch to that thinking if you're just kind of putting down like an oval for placement I know you guys are going to be doing drawings anyway you won't be doing you know usually just all of three months <laughs> Are you just using straight up raw umber to do your lines? Or are you um, raw umber and a little bit of white, just okay. so it's lighter. And then I thin it out, you know, pretty thinly, just so that, it, you know, that also helps make it a little bit lighter. And then it's easier to kind of push and pull the shapes. So you're just thinning it in with turf, right? Uh, yeah, I use Gamsol, but yeah. <clears throat> thinking of the gesture, I'm thinking more like detail and really trying to get a perfect shape when I just want to make it kind of loose. Um, the other thing I will usually have is like one brush with paint, one brush with turf so that I can have that as kind of my eraser. So that way if I need to kind of push push stuff around, I can do it that way and then go back in and kind of fix my, fix my lines a little bit. I didn't have the, the video thing going yet. So you tone the tone the canvas with raw umber and, and solvent just because it, it's yeah, just more comfortable for you for uh, ju judging values. And yeah. So I, you know, I usually take my time at this point because I want to get a relatively good drawing before I head into um, values. She's got a, a very nice jawline. So I think some of the things that I've seen students in the past kind of forget to look at is the turns in the jaw and the structure of the brow and the eye socket. So you can get a pretty good likeness using the big shapes in the brow, um, even if you don't have like a lot of detail yet for the eyes. Um, when it starts, like if I feel like using the shadow shape is going to be helpful in determining um, proportion, then I'll kind of start to indicate it a little bit. But I don't usually fill it in. Yeah, I mean, you know, it depends on what I'm doing. There are other times where maybe I'll fill it in with just a really transparent note. Um, but I usually will go in with like pretty soon with full color once I start building up my, my values. So like 
you know, I know Andy kind of uses more of a limited palette. Uh, for me, it was a little easier to do it, you know, closer to what I'm seeing right away rather than do just a value only. What do you mean by that? Um, well, I had a tendency to over mix. And for me, I would use a complement, you know, not black or umber. I, I would almost never use black or umber to make something darker. But I would overuse like the complement of the color to make something darker to the point where it was like too grayish. So if I start off with something that's already a limited palette, it for me, since I overmixed, it kind of killed the initial color. And then I find it a lot harder to build up color then if you start off with something a little too intense, it's easier to kind of knock it down. I know a lot of people can do really great things with a limited palette. I just wasn't one of them. And I am kind of checking like her side of her head is about here. Where's her shoulder going to be? So just make sure you're kind of thinking about those those relationships as well. What do you use to judge the relationships with shoulders? Um, the angle between like where her head is to like where the corner is. I'll check that. Um, I'm, you know, you can do comparative, like how many heads high you know, what's the, the height of her head compared to the width of the shoulders. And then the other thing I just kind of have to think about is where I'm standing, her chest plate isn't completely flat to my vision. It's turned and angled a little bit that, that way. So then I really have to think about what's going on with the clavicles, um, what's going on with like the pit of the neck. The, the sternocleidomastoid is going to be very important too. Um, a lot of times I'll even put in like the angle of the, the sternum and the, the chest plate. So, on her face, I don't have a ton of shadow, but I've got that little bit off to the side and then her ears in shadow too. So sometimes that helps me just kind of figure out proportion if I kind of get that in lightly. And then I want to put in Her, where her brows are. And I have to kind of force myself to make sure I included the ears uh, when I was first starting out, but now I found that they are really helpful in just showing what the tilt is of her head. Um, what the turn is of the head, uh, the you know the light source, what that's like. So just don't ignore the ears. So for me, I found it easier to start kind of take my best guesses to where the bottom of the nose is and then I can always go back and measure and do some comparisons. Um, usually from the bottom of the chin to the bottom of the nose is pretty close to the bottom of the nose to the eyebrows but it also depends on if there's a significant tilt to the head. So they're just um, comparisons you can kind of think about but I wouldn't rely on them like super heavily at the beginning, especially if you have a significant turn or a tilt.
the shape of the brow. Uh -huh. I just saw you like kind of put some more point angle changes. Was that just the actual eyebrows themselves, or are you grabbing some sort of structure? It's st structure of the eyebrows and the um, inside of the eye socket, because right. you get, okay. are going to get a good shadow shape in there, or at least you know a little darker. Okay. And so you really need to understand that information before you go in with the eyeballs themselves. Sure. Because I found that people don't leave enough room between like the brow and the eyes. And one of the things that really helped me too as I was starting to do more portraits was you can check it out on breaks, but I have like a whole panel that I did of just studies of eyes. And I just used photos of models that I'd had. Um, I even used like, I, think, I don't know, there might have just been like a couple, just photos I found off the internet just so I could do a, a study of an eye. Mm -hmm. And that helped me kind of figure out what was going on with how much room to leave for um, the upper and the lower lid and what are the angles along the upper lid versus the lower lid, because the lower lid is usually much more arced. Uh, the lower lid is gonna be a lot, the lower lash line and lid is a lot flatter. So I think one thing I'm noticing on mine is I'm not getting her turned enough, because she's just, tiny bit turned. So some of the things to look for when you're thinking about the turn is, because I tend to make sure, I make everything look like I'm seeing it from the front and finalize it. So instead, I've really got to check how much from the side of the nose to that side am I seeing versus this side to that uh, part of the cheek. So I think I'm going to have to Ram a little bit off over here. If you are doing a portrait, a profile, or somewhere you can see the connection with the back of the jaw to the ear, that's another thing that I think um, people don't connect enough, is because you've got to make sure that this turn back here leads them right into the ear. Other kind of measurements that I'll look for, how far out is the corner of the mouth compared to the corner of the nose, and then where does the inside tear duct, um, tear duct fall in relationship to the corner of the mouth.
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I'm not trying to draw like a perfect <clears throat> eye right now. I just, uh, just kind of still moving things around. I'm still not quite satisfied with that I have her turn working well. So those are kind of the things that I'm looking at at this point. What specific things are you trying to do to fix that? Um, how, like, so the way I'm seeing the nose, I see a little bit more of this side of her nose yep. than I do. So that's one of the things. And then still just like the space between the cheeks and the nose. I do get to a point where, for me, it's helpful to move into values, just because I can drive myself crazy. Um, just working out a sketch is just a linear form. What's on your mind right now, Laura? Um, getting a little bit more of the shape of the eyes working with the eye sockets themselves. Gotcha. Um, yeah, you can take the mic. Are you warm enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so when I go back, I'll probably start to just add, this is maybe a little, you know, I'd probably get the drawing a little bit better if this was something that I had time on. Um, but for the moment, I think I will start going in with some values so I can see proportions a little bit better. Sure.
right, so I think I'm going to go in with some of my shadow shapes. Um, Jennifer's got it actually. Thanks anyway. So I usually go in with some of my biggest, like what is obviously shadow first. And is that like are you going choosing color for that intentionally? Uh yeah, I try to aim for Close to, you know, mm -hmm. as accurate as I can in the laying stage, um, and value. But yeah, at this stage, I'm kind of still thinking about it as kind of just a, a little bit of more of a drawing mm -hmm. thing. But with as you know, as accurate as the values I can get, value and colors I can get. Are you differentiating with the different shadow shapes values, or are you choosing like one value right now? I did differentiate a little bit, okay. so like this is okay. definitely a little, little darker, a little warmer than yeah. this. Okay. So I'm still, I'm not focusing a ton right now on any um, wet area, I'm still moving around, I'm still just trying to get enough of a turn working so I don't leave that too far behind. that I try not to do too is if I put down a color and it's way off, way too dark or way too cold or something, I don't want to keep using it. Um, but some people say, I'll just, I'm just trying to get paint down, which is, fu is fine, but I mean, you could just get the whole paint, you know, paint the whole thing black. The 
then you're getting some paint down. <laughs> so it's still like about balancing your time, like how much time do I want to put in? I don't want to put in time to make everything at this stage like perfect. I'm just still trying to get relationships working out. But if there's something that's obviously going to be detrimental later that you're going to have to go back and really fix, then I would suggest remixing that color. All right, just so I start to get some of my lighter notes down, um, I'm going to kind of think about where's my brightest bright. And I'm seeing in the forehead, um, the highlight on the nose, and then in the cheek. So you probably aren't really going to be able to see much because it's pretty close to the background value. I, I want to think about those things pretty early on so that I don't head like too far in one direction and start making everything, you know, too uh, too dark in my half tone. What color did your next clear highlight? Um, it was white and a little alizarin. Compared to um, the shadows, the highlights are relatively cool, and then the, the half tones that are surrounding the highlights then kind of get a little bit warmer. So, like just the overall skin tone, um, you know, places where it's not a direct highlight or specular highlight, uh, but it's still in the light family. They're still working relatively thin, not as thin as the wash. Or top, yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is still pretty thin. The other thing to think about is this is my light side. You know, this is then still in the light family, but slowly turning away. So generally speaking, like this is going to be darker than this cheek. And then for the hair, I mean, I don't want to draw in strands at this point. I'm just trying to think about big shapes and big areas where are things getting hit by light. Um, I like to keep my hair, the uh, layer, thin, especially at the beginning. And if possible, like pretty transparent, because then I found it works better when you're laying, when you're putting layers on top of that. It feels like it gives it a little bit more depth.
should probably get a little bit of the color of the neck and too, which is usually, um, it, can, it can end up being really bright depending on where the light's hitting it. So there are some times when I will just uh, make a choice and just tone it down just a little bit so it's not like super bright. Noticing a little bit cooler note. That's a little too dark. Um, on this side of the lip. So if you kind of feel on your own face where from the filter on <coughs> right beneath the nose, as it turns to the sides, then that plane changes and it's not going to get as much light. unify things a little bit and get uh, something down kind of for every area before I get too far in and start pushing the eyes and the nose. So I probably should put in something for the background <coughs> too. Um, let me just do a few more things in that face. So there I put down a color and it was way too warm. So I want to kind of get a little more purpley, uh, more alizarin red than the cat red. And then normally the upper lip, because of the way it goes from the 
The top of the upper lip then starts to tuck under, so then usually the upper lip gets a little less light than the lower lip. So the lower lip usually protrudes out a little bit more. This is messier than I usually <laughs> work, but now I want to just start to do a little bit more structure on the eyes, taking into account how much space between the brow and then it tucks under and then the eyeball and the eyelid comes out. I don't have anything for like the iris or anything yet. Um, I'll get to that and get a little bit more information. But I think hold off on putting that in. I think people will just really get to wanting to push the eyes really far at the beginning. And I think it's more, for me it's more important if you're thinking about the structure of the eyes. Oh, still I'm checking because usually uh, like the eyelids are going to have a little bit more warmth to them. Um, so I am, you know, I am still thinking about color temperature and value. I mean, that's to the point where I'm going to like freeze up and spend 20 minutes trying to get like the exact color to put down. Um, but just like get relatively close. I found that if I'm if the value is pretty close and I'm having trouble with the drawing, then it's like, well, if the value is right, then I just have to look at the shape. I think uh, sometimes if I leave the uh, value behind for too far and don't consider that or edge work, then I can focus like too much on the shape when maybe it's just a little tweak of an edge or uh, the shape. And if the paint is wet or dry underneath, if it's like wet, then I could probably just wipe it off if it's totally, you know, super far off. Um, if it's just a little off, you can kind of usually just nudge it over with your paintbrush. Gotcha. And if it's dry, you just paint over it. Yeah, and if it's dry, you just paint, paint over it. Um, and it also just depends too on like how far off is it. So if you are Painting over something, just make sure you're not like painting over something that you could leave that's already pretty working pretty well. Right. So, you know, sometimes if you have to make a little change, people just to paint over the whole entire thing. So maybe you could have just adjusted it a little bit. If it's if it's like a bigger composition maybe with hands, I would probably do a painting. If it's just head and shoulders, 
I would probably just start like this. My still lifes, I almost never do a drawing unless it's like, you know, a bigger or more intricate. I like I did one in, the, in my studio on there just to kind of show how I, you know, how I might do it if I were still in school. Yeah, and then there are some, if it's a more complicated idea, I will usually do like a study. Like a, um, you know, either just do like, in my sketchbook, I just have a few ideas that I, you know, hope to get to. And so I'll just have sketches and then I can refer to those. Um, and then maybe do like a, just a small color study to work things out. Um, on the first day of painting too, I like to make sure that I'm getting uh, patting down my, my brush strokes. So if this were the end of the day, uh, I'd probably be patting things down. Is that the timer? No. Laura, could you flash your palette in front of the camera? Yeah. Do you see that? Or just What's like up here? Yeah. 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 There we go. Okay, well, sorry, could you repeat what you said earlier about, so you, in school you use the Paxton palette, yes, but now. Yes, in school I use the Paxton palette. But now I have either added some or sh uh, like swapped out some. Mm -hmm. So like an example is the yellow ochre that we use in school. I switched to transparent gold ochre because yellow ochre for me was always like really opaque mm. and I had a hard time mixing it. Um, trying to think of what else I swapped. I added screen number. Okay. Uh, Dale told me that one. Oh, right. So, <laughs> cause I always had a hard time with Viridian, but now I, I do like Viridian. So yeah, some of them are like the ones over here are pretty transparent, so okay. I like to play around with the transparent under colors. Nice. Okay. And then some of the other ones on the far right were ones that you. you These you, are kind of shortcut colors. Right. The yeah. That you so somewhere I would to. mix up. Got it. Cool. Yeah. And turning away from the light, so you don't get as much light there. And then this is shadow more, um, and then you get a little bit more light on the lid. And then in the eyes themselves, um, like on this side, this I should probably go a little darker with because it's turning away from the light. And to get the ball, the eyeball itself, to turn, I want to look at the difference in value between like this side and that side. The other thing is like if the light's coming from here, like where's your highlight? Sometimes I think people just kind of put it in the middle of the eye. So they have to kind of think about that whole round shape of the of the eyeball to make sure that you have it like high enough where it's making sense. And then you get the on the iris, the light filters through to the other side. So usually on the iris, the opposite side of the light, you're gonna get a little lighter iris, and then the darker where the highlight is, and it's a little darker. So I don't know if I have any that kind of show that. A little bit here. So like here's the highlight and then the iris. Oh yeah, so I was on getting a little more structure in the shoulders. If anyone 
You saw Dale do portrait demos, didn't you, mm -hmm. Christine? Yeah. Dale would do like her entire portrait demo with one brush. <laughs> yeah. And I always had like 10. Mm -hmm. The bouquet. Yeah. A brush? Yeah. She would do it like with one brush, like that size. The whole portrait? Yeah. What size is that brush? Uh, this one's a 10, I think. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Or I challenge you to do the rest no. of the <laughs> <laughs> You don't I know. 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 No, she was just like, like, yeah, she could just do it. Yeah. She's not going to write. Yeah, she, I mean, she, she only, she didn't really replace that many rags either. She had like yeah. one, one paper towel and the one brush and just your normal size little palette cup there. Yeah. Or maybe even smaller. Yeah. And um, she, she used uh, Old Holland paint and she, she didn't grind her bristles into her palette either like I do <laughs> trying to mix colors she you know she'd just kind of tickle it and it'd be the right one and then <laughs> pop it on there and it was always like a thick amount of paint too yeah she painted a lot more thickly than I have ever painted is that old Holland is that a soft brown or is that spreadable or um yeah I mean it's really more expensive it's more expensive paint and it's usually doesn't have as much of the filters as some of like the cheaper brands. So like when you are getting into paint more, don't ever get the scooter gray ones. Because no. you squirt those out and it's like all oil. It's just and you know the the color intensity isn't there usually with the scooter gray paint. Um, yeah, so I mean there are certain colors that I have from old Holland that I just really like. But like a cadmium from Old Holland would probably be about like 60 bucks or oh. something for one tube. 60 bucks. Yeah, it's expensive, but it's really nice. So I usually only have a couple colors from there. They're usually the series one or something, so they're cheaper. Doesn't Old Holland, um, what's the brand I guess I haven't noticed. It's less flexible with the paint? No, I haven't really noticed that. I mean, I don't, like I said, I don't use a ton of their colors, so I mean. Isn't that what he used? probably had all his students grind his paint. <laughs> Which I'm going to make you guys do. <laughs> <laughs> so do the research, because I don't want to do research. That seems like a disaster. <laughs>
So in terms of, once I get a little bit more body and paint down, and I'm starting to look for more subtle value shifts and value and color temperature shifts, um, what I usually am thinking about with this kind of lighting or what you guys have in your cubes, you, you generally speaking, you have like a warm shadow compared to uh, the relatively cool highlights. Um, and then usually along the edge of the shadow shape, right along the bedbug line, as it's going into the light, it usually is a little bit cooler. So that's kind of where I'll look for my for my cooler notes is in that area. Um, yeah, so any more of the subtle transitions, usually as it's shifting towards the light, maybe I'll see kind of blues or purples or greens depending on the person's skin tone. I don't want it to sound like formulaic, but you know, generally if someone has, what from what I see, if someone has kind of a more fair skin tone, I, I usually see more purples and blues. Whereas if someone has like a more olive skin tone, like Adriana, I tend to see more olives, maybe. Yeah, it's like kind of some more um, not super intense purples along the, the bed bug line. And that's you, the other thing too is usually in your half tones along the bed bug line, they aren't going to be as intense. So they usually are a little closer to neutral. Um, so just, you know, if you put something down and you're like, well, I see a cool note, but that looks way off, then maybe check is it too cold. far on this one but um, once I start to get into doing more like modeling of the form then I really want to think about what direction that form is going in like if it's along the cheek where is it connecting maybe um, so but you know I don't think I'd get to the point where I'm thinking really specific modeling Now I am trying to get a little bit more of her character. So I'm looking for, like in the lips, I'm looking for um, just the quality of the, the shape maybe for the upper lips. Does she have a really high peak along the, like the cupid's bow part, right by the filthrum? Or is it a little flatter? So those are kind of the things that I look for. Should probably get more info for the nose too. The nose and the, and the eyes. So you, um, the other thing in terms of color intensity, you usually see a little bit more color intensity, the mouth obviously, and then usually the nose. And the ears will have kind of a higher, a warmer, um, higher chroma. That's what you mean by color intensity, higher chroma? Um, so, like, since the, they're smaller forms, so usually like the blood vessels are a little closer to the surface of the skin. So then, the, in terms of color intensity, it's got more 
punch to it than like it's it's farther away from the neutrals. Uh, yours, I don't know if you, you probably have a better way to, to explain it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, so I add a little bit more, trying to get a little closer to detail, like I was talking about, which is the general uh, shape of the eyes. So I'm trying to think about where's, like, say the highest peak on the upper lid. Um, also looking at the shape behind, like the upper lid, as they descend into the eye socket more. So just kind of thinking about that, how that gets darker when it goes back and tucks behind the um, upper lid. I'm still trying to keep at this stage things pretty soft too because then I can really choose at the end like where do I want maybe a pop from something that's a little bit sharper. Usually in a portrait it's going to be like the eyes. And with this lighting you do get a little bit of a shadow from the upper lid onto the whites of the eye itself too.
was thinking about that my eyes feel like they're getting a little bit uh, muddy. I need a little bit more clarification as to what's going on there. making sure I have enough value shift between the whites of the eyes and the iris and the pupil. So I'm just kind of looking, it just all goes back to what are my value relationships. Right. And are my shapes working properly? Um, is the like behind the lid, like I was talking about before, so I can get some depth in there. Uh, I have a tendency to make the eyes too big, and because you know. Especially in a portrait, everyone's like, well, the eyes are the most important. So I really have to watch myself that I don't start to, to do that with my portraits. So I think I'm getting a little too round under that eye. pushing and pulling just to see if I can get closer to the light. Interesting how it goes down on the radio. She has a lot of 
So one of the places I'm noticing is that I'm too, too dark here because that side is getting a little bit more light. So I want to kind of lighten up on the brow bone a little bit. So there's not as much contrast between the brow bone on that side as there is on the brow bone on the shadow side. think about too is like when I stand back here and I squint a little the eyebrows aren't going to be super bright in the in the light family so just make sure you don't put them in like they're I don't know Ernie's eyebrows for, for Ernie <laughs> So I'm just, as I'm going, I'm still not like really getting stuck. I just don't want to get stuck in any one area because I've done the, I've had done the mistake where you work really hard on the eyes. You're spending like two hours up there working on the eyes, and then 
at the end of the day, you realize they don't relate to anything else on the face. So just make sure you keep stepping back and um, just kind of look at the relationships as a whole. So I'm just trying to get in and get a little bit more information still for the eyes. Um, and then I'll probably move into doing a little bit more of the hair too. And, and you know, I haven't really left behind the shoulders, so I probably should go in with those, but they aren't as fun. <laughs>
you know, I'm still trying to think about where, you know, accuracy in the shape so that I'm, it's making sense with where the light source is. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, it's working them together because, you know, you don't want to like work on one and create, try to create this one perfect eye and then the other one doesn't make sense with it. So, uh, you know, I try to keep going back and forth between the two. That also helps with like making sure the colors working together too. Cause I mean, if I'm working on both, then I'm using more of the same colors. Whereas if I paint, like try to paint one and like finish it and then go back the next day, you know, then I have to kind of make sure that I'm matching my, my colors. Um, the other thing I think, you know, think about is like where is the light hitting the lids too? So you usually get a little bit of a highlight on the on the lower lid, but it's not, you know, I don't want to put it in like super bright. I still want to keep it kind of warm. And I also want to think about like how making sure that what I've drawn for like the details of the eyes makes sense with the overall anatomy of the eye socket. And same with like thinking about the eyeball itself and the lids that go over it. Um, just so it doesn't, you know, sometimes I've drawn it and like the iris is way too far in one direction so it doesn't feel like it would be on the eyeball itself. Like it's like protruding off to the side. So I think that's another thing to kind of think about. Also for like the highlight in the eye too, sometimes if you have one a dominant eye, maybe that highlight will be a little bit brighter than the other side. Um, and if it really looks out of place too, then I just have to like look at the right value. Maybe I went like overboard and made it too late. Um, is it in the right spot? That one that I put down that is not in the right spot. And I try to also keep the edges between the iris and the square pretty soft too. Laura, would you say that the edges between what? The weights of the eye and the iris. Okay. 
I try to keep those pretty, pretty uh, uh, soft. Yeah, is it snowing out there? It's windy. It's really windy, yeah. to get in, check, I want to check the mouth, because that seems like it's kind of drifting a little to the left, so I want to look at that. Um, I want to also look at eye, the eyebrows on both sides too, just to get a little bit closer to the angles, the shapes work in there. I'd like to keep the eyebrows soft too, because otherwise it you know it usually just ends up looking too dramatic. So look for, um, in terms of getting the character, look for where where's the highest peak on the eyebrows and where does that, how does that relate to the position of the eyes themselves, just so that all those, those shapes are working together. The other thing in terms of um, the jaw is I try to look at where the turn is, um, the main turn back here compared to like the corner of the mouth just to see that I'm on the right track and that it's making sense together. shadow on the nose so it is cad cad red light and a little bit of green So I want to get in a little bit more for the hairline too, just to get a bit more depth in there. Um, so I'm usually when I start looking at one area, then I'll see something next to it <laughs> that I need to fix. So I was looking at the values on the side of her forehead and just kind of getting a little darker in here just to show not only like the little bit of the cast shadow on the forehead, but um, just so that it's I've got a little bit darker half tone in there.
So now I'm just I'm kind of looking at the shape of the highlights. Like where is there, where are the highlights in the hair? Uh, I want to get in a little bit more of the background next to the hair so I can kind of shape things a little bit better.
choose the glass because I, I yeah. the thing I can cover it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it does last a little longer that way. What? Yeah. This doesn't look like it's. She painted it with something like that light brown. So if this were like the last time I was ever going to be able to work on it, you know, I didn't have a photo reference, I would probably do a bit more with like the shoulders and stuff and try to get that worked out a little bit. Um, but I did take a photo, so I might work on it a little from that after. Yeah, that's
I mean, I like them both. Uh, I mean, I really like doing portraits. Um, but, you know, it is kind of nice just to do a, a still life at home. As I would go further on this, at, um, like if I was trying to get more of a, re, you know, really push it a lot further and get a really refined portrait, I would look and think about edge quality as things are over, as anatomy is overlapping. So thinking about like, uh, you know, edge quality as it. Uh, you know, on the brow or something, keeping those really soft, but then as it tucks under, maybe there's a little bit of a sharper edge, or just getting more depth with, like, where's the, the ear I wanted to push back, I could probably maybe go a little softer in there. Um, this is one of those places where it's like, it's almost a little lighter on the ear here than the side of the face underneath the cheekbone, so if I push that just a little bit, I can get a little bit more depth that way as well. Along the hairline where I see just a little bit of like where her part is. I want to go in and get just a little bit of the skin tone like going through there so like I said it just it looks more natural it gives you a softer edge um, and it helps to make it not look like a wig.
like I don't think we're continually working on it would make it any better at that point. Okay. Um, or the deadline is up. Uh, but I mean, okay. I'm one of those people, you know, there's some people who can just like be, okay, I'm done with this, I'm not going to work on it anymore. I'm one of the people that's like, I'm just going to keep working on it, working on it, and I have to kind of stop myself. Because some, you know, you reach a point where it's like, maybe you're not making it any better, and you're just kind of repainting areas that were had some life before, and then you start overpainting things. So, you know, it is kind of a balance. You can always check in with someone else and see, you know, some, the other thing I'll do is I'll turn my painting upside down, like when I'm getting closer to the, what I think is the end, and see if there's anything like a really sharp edge that pops out that you don't want in that specific area, or uh, is there like a really distracting transitional value that you need to like make a little bit more subtle. So I mean, there's things you can, you can look for But yeah, it's a, it's. There are some paintings that I probably should have stopped sooner on. And the other thing too is just, can I get, can I make it any better at this point in my training? Right. So, I mean, there's a certain point where if you like working on, you're working on it. Maybe there are other things you need to work on, and it would benefit you to just stop working on that and kind of take what you learned from it um, and move on to the next project. See, I haven't really put in like eyelashes, you know. So uh, usually I just kind of just think big values in there, and then maybe if they're prominent enough where I could make sense, I just put them in like really lightly. But I just sometimes I think people go in too soon. I get trying to get the eyelashes, and it looks like false eyelashes. So um, that's something to kind of think about. Um, when I'm working on the hair, I try to 
you know, keep like I was talking about values. I kind of try to keep it a little more transparent because I, I feel like it gives a little bit more depth if you have the layer underneath, a bit more transparent. And then the other thing I'll do is, you know, obviously it's always going to change from sitting to sitting. Um, but I try to find a day where maybe I really like the movement of it in terms of the gesture of the whole painting, um, just like the shape of it, or maybe it really kind of helps the, the overall composition. So that's where you can really, as an artist, kind of make some of your own choices. And so it's like, I'm not gonna change it every single time I have the model come in. Um, but I also wanna you know, keep it still pretty soft. Don't think about individual strands. Um, think about how like maybe where there's something that's, like there's kind of a little bit where this is tucking under you can kind of think about design that way. Um, but I just always think about like what's best for the painting itself, just so that you don't drive yourself crazy trying to change it every time. Um, just in terms of paint handling, try not to kind of go all in one direction because um, then it's, I feel like I've started to do that a little bit over here. But you know, if you just kind of do like you're up and down like you're painting on a wall, it's going to show. So I know sometimes people get uh, frustrated if they start to get uh, glare and then they'll kind of go in one direction because that helps with the glare, but if you do that and then you take it and it's hanging in a different place, it could be like the opposite. So I try to, like in the background, I try to go in different directions um, and then just pat down my, uh, the edge of, uh, in, you know, so I don't get ridges in my paint. Yeah, that helps. But it all, you know, it also help. I mean, like right now, it's like I, I am seeing a lot of glare. It's kind of frustrating. But you can either try to shifting your easel a little bit, especially if you're not working on like the drawing at that point. You kind of, you can always turn it back in your spot if you're making drawing adjustments. Um, but yeah, I turned it a little bit, and it seemed to help a bit. Um, but yeah, draw going and laying down the paint in different directions seems to help too. I mean, it doesn't have to be like, like you're 
completely trying to do it totally different, but just enough so that you have variety and it doesn't look like stripes. Uh, I usually use, when I'm trying to get on my edges, I usually use like a clean brush without any paint on it. Um, and just kind of go over some of my areas. If I've got something, and I don't paint super thick, but if I've got something that's like a ridge, you know, I could probably lift it up very carefully with a palette knife. Um, but I'd like to get them knocked down so that I don't have to go back in and like scrape later. So, I mean, I usually just would set aside like the last 10 minutes before I have to start cleaning up and just knock down my edges a little bit. And it doesn't have to be like where you make everything totally flat, but um, if there's an area that you just want to be a nice soft modeling area, you just don't want like thick ridges that are going to catch the light. of like the muscle or something. Um, at the beginning, it's, I don't pay as much attention to that. Atelier shirts made I mean, I mean, with puffy paint. So that'll be your job. Oh, <laughs> Graduation. <Yeah. laughs> For all the seniors. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I hear that's really 